Hello everybody, um, welcome to our webinar about resilience for trainers, coaches and educators. For those of you that attended last week's session, you'll be aware that we did experience some technical difficulties with Zoom. So we've taken some time to re-record this session to give you an improved, um, an improved version with the slides whilst they're working. So welcome back and welcome to you who didn't join us last week. We also have a special guest speaker today, our friend and colleague Gina Gardner, and she will be giving her expertise and advice for how you can cope with the psychological pressures of COVID-19 and get the best out from your learners. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and we can work through the PowerPoint uh, as we hoped to do last week. So, as I said, a very well welcome to all of you. There's people that have dialed in from all over the globe and it's wonderful to see so many of our members and so many others that are completely interested in what we do. So we hope that you find this webinar really useful. How we're going to be working today is splitting the session into three separate pieces. So first of all, we're going to do some inductions. Then we're going to talk about the science behind resilience and what actually goes on in our minds from a human perspective. And then Gina from Genuinely You is going to deliver a res resilience session with some key tips and advice and her recipe for generating the ultimate resilience and giving the best version of yourself whilst you, remote, ugh, whilst you remotely work from home and delivering sessions. So, what do we know about resilience? For those of you that have met me personally or have seen me uh, virtually online, uh, I, um, I have a background in occupational psychology, which is business psychology. And I've always been really fascinated about how we can get the best out of people and how we can get people to really, really engage when they're delivering learning sessions, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, to their learners. So my absolute passion is how do we upskill and keep adults' knowledge up to date in line with policies, in line with technical change, and in line with everything else that goes on around us in our business environment. So because I have a bit of a science background, I thought I'd take you through what we know from a scientific perspective. And what we're going to do very, very briefly before I introduce you to Gina, is just intertwine some knowledge from occupational psychology, from anthropology, the study of groups, from sociology, the study of groups within society, and also a couple of droplets of medical science. And the reason that that's important is because resilience becomes part of our mind. It's part of our imagination, it's part of our memories, and it dictates our behaviours and outcomes. So we're in a really, really uncertain time at the moment. And we've got lots going on from a business perspective. And so what we've sort of classified this into and sort of give some context around how we're intertwining these fields together, we just need to look at this little numbers that I've created for you, this little equation, if you like. So there's a lot of noise going on. We're seeing worrying news, and there's lots and lots of chatter about COVID-19. But we're also experiencing, perhaps for the first time ever, quite a lot of silence. Because as we sit home and remote work and in self-isolation, we're not used to having such a quiet environment around us. And so that takes some changes into our brains to just get used to, particularly from a work environment. So when you have new noise and new silence together, this then creates feelings of unease and confusion. And as humans, as the people that have not changed over the last couple of thousand years, we have to change our brains around to meet these challenges. And that's something that people and humans perspective, respectively, are really, really good at. 
that's why we've become the dominant species across uh, the world and the globe and built our environments up, changed the way we've learned and using technology. We know that no other species has done that on planet Earth. If anything, people are seeing different species become extinct, which is also, you know, something that's not particularly nice. Okay, so on to the science bit. As an occupational psychologist and working with Gina for this session, I decided to put together a definition. What's the definition of unprecedented times? Because we're hearing this as a new expression almost every day. People are talking about how this is an unprecedented time and what we need to do to get through it. Now, psychology and sociology really, really start with a definition of something. So they identify the variable that they're measuring, but they give it a clear definition, just so everybody's on the same page. So when I looked up uh, the Oxford Dictionary definition of unprecedented times, it's a simple statement that nothing like it has ever happened before, been done before, or been known before. And all I could see relating to an unprecedented time was the pictures of the supersonic jet that we put together, which is something that lasted, um, that actually traveled, sorry, faster than the speed of sound. So that's all we have in comparison in terms of using this expression. And of course, there is also a certain amount of personal memories that we've had in terms of 9-11, in terms of 7-7, in terms of the Vietnam War, if you were around to look at that and be you know, watching it from afar. We have had these crisis situations previously. And so what's happening now is we're seeing new images. We're seeing images that we've never come across before in these unprecedented times. So we're seeing queues for the supermarkets, but we've all got to stand two meters apart from one another. We're all seeing this rather new image of these little round things with suckers coming out of them, which is defining a, what the virus is, if you like. And then perhaps the most scary image we're seeing is doctors, nurses, and those on the front line who are wearing hazmat suits. And if you had told us uh, last week, sorry, last month or last year, that this would be a normal situation, this would be coming a new normal, we wouldn't have believed it. And certainly many people that have plans for 2020 have just seen them fall flat on their face. So all of this uncertain news we're experiencing, these unprecedented times, are creating a really, really negative environment for us. And that's really important to keep in mind when we think about resilience. Now we're remote working and we're self-isolating. This means that we're apart physically from our colleagues and from our families. And if there's one thing that humans are, it's a, we're a group species. We are not designed to be virtual, to be online and to be isolated. And so we're really not making light of this situation. It's obviously very, very devastating watching what's going on in the news. But the problem is for many people is that they're starting to experience a little bit cabin fever. And so actually this remote working, this self-isolation is starting to feel like we're in a little bit of a prison cell. And there's lots and lots and lots of statements about staying at home. That there's government adverts, people are using hashtags on Twitter, stay at home. They're, everybody is being pushed into being in an isolated environment. And as I said, humans are social animals. This is something that we don't like to do. It's something that doesn't come naturally. What we're also seeing though, on the other side of the coin, is the very best of humanity. It's something that we're really, really good at. And I hate using the word pivot because it's being used so much at the moment, but humans always find a solution. They always find a way to get out of the challenges that they are experiencing. And this mainly comes initially from our imagination, but it also comes from our spirit, our soul, 
and this idea that we need to help one another. We need to be altruistic and that's what makes humans survive and makes us so successful. So what we're seeing now is rainbows in windows, huge thanks to the NHS. We're having the clapping experience every Thursday. And it's really interesting there because if we take us back 50,000 years, clapping is really similar to drumming and that's a comforting noise for humans when they can't be in physical touch with one another and when we lived as tribes the drums were used as a way for people to come back from hunter gathering but also to ward off predators so we are using this innate psychological approach to becoming over the worst of things so following me in this session, I'm going to introduce Gina to you and we're going to provide some advice and tools which will basically enable you to build a really positive learning experience for your delegates. Because remember, this is not only happening to you, this situation with these terrible images and concerning times, but also um, a, a separate uh, dichotomy, if you like, also being reassured by the support that we're showing the NHS, by communities joining together and finding a way to connect with one another. So I'm now going to hand over to Gina, who's an, an expert in resilience, and she's going to walk you through all sorts of different points to help build that resilience inside. So Gina, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm hopeful um, this will stop your other, so I'm going to continue. Right, so bear with me. Okay, um, so I want to talk to you about some really practical tips for um, creating the very best situation for yourself, your loved ones, your colleagues and friends, bearing in mind that this is an unprecedented uh, experience in all our lifetimes. But, you know, the interesting thing is, as we go through our lifetime, we're consistently meeting things which are completely new, very different. And these are principles that will work not just now, although some of them are, are, are somewhat specific. They're general principles for life. Just before I start, a little bit about my background. You know, I've got well over 30 years of experience of developing leadership um, and personal empowerment. And there's never been a time when great leadership has been needed more than now. So let's get started. How do you cope with the psychological pressure of COVID-19 and other crises? And for some reason, I haven't got, it's not moving. My share, oh, there it is, thank you, pardon. So my 10 top tips for coping with the crisis. It's really important to remember it's not the challenge which defines us, but it is how we respond to it. Now, you don't know me from Adam, but I've learned to walk twice as an adult. And that was very challenging. But ultimately, Focusing what I could do rather than what I couldn't meant that I could run my award-winning school from a wheelchair. And there were huge gifts in that. And I want you to think about, rather than all of the terrible things, and please make no mistake, I am not making light of this situation. But ultimately, how we respond to it is going to make the difference not only to us, but the people who are around us, and what's going to happen in the future. Now my first big tip, and please, this is so important, it's your mindset. If you want a better quality of life, then you need to think about the quality of your thinking. Because our thoughts drive our emotions, our language and our behaviour. And what's really interesting is that the research, research shows that 95% of our thinking is habitual. It doesn't cross our conscious mind. We don't give our thoughts a thought. So we have these um, cycles of thinking that go round and round. I mean, how many of you got that voice in your head which says to you, shouldn't have done that? Or why on earth didn't, did you do um, this? Or why haven't you done that? 
that habitual nag in our voice is a really good example of habitual thinking. Now, our thoughts are driven by our beliefs and beliefs are installed very early on. Now, that's great when those beliefs are empowering, but if they're not, then it can really get in the way. So if you believe you're not good enough, if you believe that you're going to fail, if you believe that you're too poor, too tall, too fat, too thin, that belief will stay with you and will drive your thoughts and your perceptions. So it really makes sense to do an audit of your beliefs about yourself and the world. And we have beliefs about everything. Beliefs about money, relationships, um, about how the world is governed. We have beliefs on everything. So it's really important that you take some time during this lockdown to do a reflection on which beliefs are serving you and which are not. Because our beliefs in turn drive our emotions, our language and our behaviours. So there are three options in our beliefs. Option number one, I'm going to fail. I've, I'm absolutely going to fail. And for many people, their way of dealing with that is not to try. They don't even get started. So it becomes a done deal. But the second option, which is, I fear I will fail, is going to give you um, a very different set of decisions to the third option, which is, I believe I will succeed. Now, there are many examples of how our beliefs about success make a difference. I wonder how many of you listening to this have in your cupboards at home a Dyson Hoover. Now, you may not be aware that when he created his first working Hoover, he had 2,000 um, attempts before he got a working Hoover. Now, just think what would have happened if at 1,999 he'd given up. You may be familiar with Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister ran the first four-minute mile. Now, that he ran that fast is amazing, given the fact that the medics of the time believed that if he ran that fast, that he would die. Not that he might, but that he would. That he went forward anyway is incredible. But what I find even more incredible is that within 30 days, 30, more than 30 other people had run a four minute mile. And the only difference was, is because they believed it was possible to do it and not to die. So what are your beliefs? What do you think about your capacity to succeed? Because more millionaires are made during times of, of crisis and, and of um, uh, difficulty than are ever made in boom. Each belief generates different decisions. And I think it's really important to recognize that believing that you will succeed doesn't mean you have to know all of the ways to do it. You don't have to know the how straight away, but you do know have to know the what, and you, what's really important is the why. Why is that important to you? Because if you've got a really clear understanding of what you're trying to achieve and why that's important, you are much more likely to succeed. So if you look at the relationships between our emotions, our language and behaviours, they are all driven by our beliefs. That's the sweet spot. And so it really is worth spending some time on that. The second thing is about our perspective. Now, if you look at the picture in, on the slide, some of you will immediately see the old crone with a scarf on her head, whilst others will see the young lady, very glamorous, with the hat and the feather. Now, neither is better than the other. That's really important, but they are very different. And our perspective drives our reality. So while some people will only see COVID as a disaster, and of course it is if you've lost a loved one, if your business is in trouble, but there will be other people who recognise that it is a disaster, but they will also be looking for the opportunities. And if you look for opportunities, they are there. Our perspectives are really important. Imagine yourself in a train. You're sitting there and there's a man in the train with two young children and the kids are behaving appallingly. They are jumping up and down on the railway seats. They are shouting and screaming. What would your first perspective be? The man can't be bothered. 
not a great father. But would your perspective change if I told you that he was traveling home from hospital where he'd just been to see his wife and he'd just been told that she'd got days to live? New information comes in all the time and it shifts our perspective because it's an absolute truism that if you change the perspective, you change the reality. Think about the room you're sitting in and imagine now that you get up and you go to the doorway and you look into the room rather than being in the room. Your perspective shifts. And one of the things that I is to give you the opportunity to choose to shift your perception and to look at things in a way that is more empowering to you. What we focus on um, is really, really important. Now, I said to you earlier in this presentation that, that I've been wheelchair bound and I, I ran a, a, a very successful school for over 20 years, mostly from a wheelchair. Four days after coming out of one of the spinal surgeries and I, I had a, a two whilst I was ahead, um, I was back at school. And people said, aren't you brave? Actually, that's not true. If I stayed at home and somebody hadn't filled the kettle and um, put a cup down, I couldn't make a cup of tea. I had daytime television and I could read a book. Or somebody could help me get into school. I could use my brain, my mouth patently works, my hands worked, and I could do something that I found very rewarding that was really useful and that I was good at. Which would you choose? to stay at home and focus on what I couldn't do. And I'm not saying that everybody who's got a disability should behave in the way I do. I was fortunate in that I could go into school and I could really operate effectively. But think about your way of being. What do you focus on? Do you focus on all the things that have gone wrong and the things that aren't working? Or are you focusing on what you can do and how you can manage this situation? You're going to have to be prepared to step out of your comfort zone. If you don't and you're not prepared to do things differently, then the old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got, will be absolutely true for you. This is the time to do things differently. And I find it quite interesting how many companies who said to people, no, you can't work from home. We haven't got the technology and what would we do about the security? Are now finding that working from home works pretty well. Why? because they focused on making it happen. What's really important in all of this is that you focus on how you might harness your own skills, experience, and so on, and the expertise of your staff. You know, have you got together and brainstormed about what you might be able to do, how you could turn this around? Now, it's been important up to now in the, in the COVID virus, but my goodness me, it's going to be even more important as we move from this situation into easing the lockdown. How on earth are you going to manage that safely? You're going to need all of the creativity of you and your team um, in order to do that and to do that effectively. And I would suggest reach out to organizations like CPD, people like me, um, networks, and share the expertise and experience and creativity of other people, but more of that later. I wanna give you two examples. David is a young man that um, I've worked with, um, and he is a, a chief chef in a restaurant. They've got a posh name, but I can't remember what it is. And the restaurant was closed and his income suddenly not there. He was very concerned about what he could do. He's got a big mortgage. And we were talking and out of the conversation, I have to say the ideas weren't mine, but the questions were mine. What came out is that he has now started up a business, which started with friends and families um, and has now mushroomed. And even since last week when we recorded that, the number of people on his books are much bigger. What he's offering is three times a week that a two course meal will be delivered to your door, uh, left in sealed containers on your doorstep for you to be socially um, separate, but to have um, a beautifully cooked meal delivered to you. He, he, he has got onto his, the suppliers at the restaurant who are supplying him at home. He cooks one day, he delivers the next. 
In the first week he had 20. He's got well over 100 people now and he delivers within a 20 mile radius. And he was talking about actually employing somebody else to do the driving because he can't cope with the numbers. And one of the people he delivered to said, I'm really worried about my 90 year old dad. It's his birthday and we wanted to do something special. We were gonna to come to the restaurant, but we can't. And so David delivered a three course meal and a cake to the old man's doorstep. Um, on his birthday as a surprise. Now what started off as, what the hell am I gonna do? My, I've got no income, I've got no way of earning an income, has now started an enterprise that I suspect he may very well continue on his own because it's working very well. My next example, Jackie, actually still in the food industry, um, that's just, uh, just happens to be um, a coincidence. Um, and her training was to go in and talk to people um, uh, about how they could be safe with, with a special diets. And her business was just getting off the ground and doing really, really well. And within the first week of the lockdown, everybody cancelled. And when I spoke to her, she was absolutely beside herself, single parent, mortgage to, to run. But out of the conversation, I said to her, well, you know, you, could, you were doing this first face to face. Could you deliver this online? But the upshot is that she went to some of her companies and said, you're employing lots and lots of uh, part time new people because you are so busy, but you've not been given the opportunity to give them the training. Let me do the training in terms of basic safety uh, and diets for you. And so she created an online training program, which is now selling. And since that, organizations have come back to her and asked her to do bespoke training. Why? Because she's focused on what she can do, her expertise, and she's looked to do things differently. You do need to experiment and recognize that sometimes things will fail. And if you're using technology, I mean, as we found last week, sometimes it doesn't work as you want it to work, however much you practice. And we'll talk about practicing more later. But use those um, situations where you do fail as an opportunity to learn because then it's never wasted. So my next top tip is plan strategically. And I want to talk to you about the difference between blind optimists and pessimists. Now it's a continuum. Blind optimists are those Pollyannas who are the ostrich. You know, everything's gonna be fine. No need to worry, it'll all come out in the wash. Right at the other end of the spectrum, you've got pessimists who think to themselves, oh, everything's doom and gloom, we're doomed, we're doomed. But what I'm suggesting to you is the best place to be is to be optimistic, but not blindly. Take all of the data, all of the information in and recognize that actually you will find your way through this because this is gonna pass. Optimists look for the opportunities. Interestingly, the research shows that optimists are healthier, they are more successful in life and they actually live longer. Because all of the pessimism, the negativity has an impact on your immune system. It has an impact on your energy and the way in which people interact with you. So it's really important to be optimistic. And if you know that you are naturally a blind optimist or a pessimist, then get some help because you can learn to be an optimist. Recognize the place of your emotions, particularly in decision making. If you're coming from a place of fear, you're going to make very, very different um, decisions to one of coming to a place from confidence and love. Plan for the worst. Even though you're an optimist, plan for the worst. If the very, very worst happens, then we can do this. And don't leave it too late to make the right decisions because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. If your business is going to go under, if you don't take some very significant staffing issues, then you need to take those staffing issues. But do it with integrity and compassion and because it's the right thing to do, not because you're in a blind panic. Plan for the best. If things get better, then this is what I'm gonna do. And then create milestones. If this happens, well, I could do this. So that at least when things happen, even if they're different, you are in that mindset of finding solutions rather than focusing on the problem. Prioritize. 
Many people got completely and utterly exhausted in the first few weeks of this because they were Zoomed out. They spent, you know, 15 hours on Zoom and wondered why they'd got a headache, a sore throat and square eyes. Look at where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. And remember that you have three commodities at your disposal. Your time, your energy and your money. You can use your money to buy other people's time and energy, but you can only use those resources once. So make them work for you. So next tip is around relationships. And I can't overestimate the relationship, the importance of this. Most importantly, the relationship you have with yourself. And we've talked about doing an audit of your emotions. Because great leaders lead themselves first. Take the, the initiative. Lead by example. And it's just so important that you keep in contact with your team, with your clients. It's crucial to maintain meaningful relationships and contact. And this is not about selling. I was talking to one of my clients, which is a big hotel, lovely hotel, but of course they're closed. And I said to the general manager, have you been in touch with your, with your clientele? They've got a database of thousands of people who've been to stay or come for afternoon tea or lunch. And he said, no. I said, well, how about just sending them an email and saying, look, we realize life is difficult, we're missing you, but we would just want you to know that we're thinking of you, and if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Just think when this is all over, who are the people that you're gonna remember? Are they those that have made no contact or those that have actually cared enough to make a contact that was meaningful with you? Now, it's not being done for sales and marketing, but actually, it's good practice too. And this is not just true of coronavirus. You know, the number of, of clients when I started working with them, you know, they talk about email, um, email um, projects. And I say, well, how many times have you emailed and what have you emailed about? And they email once and it doesn't have any impact and that's it. And they assume that their emails are going to build a relationship on one email where they go straight into trying to sell something. It's not how you make friends and it's not how you create clients either. But it's also important that you create and maintain great contact with family and friends. And one of the nice things that's happened is I've heard from so many people personally and other people talking about how they've reconnected with old friends because they've made the time. Make sure that you do. Let's go back to working relationships. You know, much of the conversations that people are having are work related. But remember that it's important that that interaction, which is not focused on a project, can often create huge creativity. It, it acts as the glue in the team. And it's really important that you make sure that there are opportunities for that to go on. But also brainstorming, sharing ideas. And I would say to you, this is a time if you've got people on furlough, you know, invest in some training. You know, while they're sitting at home, they could be doing the Enlightened Leadership Program. They could be doing their um, formal uh, ex or working towards formal exams for all sorts of things. Or even if it's just at a personal level and you've always wanted to learn a new language, get on and do it. Remember not only to contact existing clients and customers, but to think about how you can reach out to potential customers in creative ways. Not just we want to sell this to you when it's all over, but actually engaging with them in a whole variety of ways that are meaningful to them. Networks. Now, there was a time when the only networks were face to face, but now there's a lot of online networks and they're doing some brilliant work. Uh, a collaboration Global, and there's an address in a later slide, they do a fabulous a way of networking, very, very different, looking at personal and spiritual education um, and growth, as well as networking in a business context. Um, if you want an international one, then there's the veranda. Uh, there are all sorts of ways of networking, and it's just so important at the moment. And make the focus not just work, but on getting to know people. And so the other thing is, you know, do you belong to meetup meetings? I've got two London meetings and putting on online um, programs for those. Doesn't cost you anything. Lovely way of meeting people. Just be creative. 
It's really important to say take radical, and I mean radical responsibility for your own emotional state, your words, your actions, or lack of them. And that's true not just for now, but it's true always. But I think this is particularly pertinent if you're uh, at home in a small environment with your partner, with your children. You know, everybody's under stress, your children particularly, because their whole lives have been uh, turned upside down. It's so easy to trigger one another. Let's go back to that mind of mindfulness. 95% of what we do is habitual. So when somebody uses that tone of voice with an edge, it will trigger you into a response, which is based on something that happened when you were little, rather than that situation. How often have you heard somebody say, it's not what they say, it's the way in which they say it that upsets you. But if you take responsibility for yourself, no one can make you unhappy or angry or frustrated unless you choose to let them. If you need some help with that, reach out. It's so important. Be kind to yourself and others. You know, we are in strange situations. I'm in my house. I'm in lockdown. I've been out twice in the last seven and a half weeks. It's weird. So do be kind to yourself and other people. Recognize what your, your triggers are and be tolerant. You know, the children are going to um, play up in direct proportion to how you're trying to get on with other things. So give them a bit of attention, but say to them, right, 10 minutes, I'll read you a story, but ultimately um, I've got to get on with my work. So you're going to do this and I'll do this. And when we've finished, then we'll go out in the garden and play or we'll play a game or we'll watch telly together. But if you just say, go away and get on, they will mither you to death because what children want more than anything is your time and attention. And that's one of the bonuses for children. When they are gray, they will talk about this time that they spent time with you uh, during lockdown and it will become very precious, even though at times it's really challenging. Let's talk about the pressures that are running a business and a family and I'm not underestimating that. You know, having children running around wanting your attention when you're trying to make an important phone call or that you are trying to get on and, and create something, it's very difficult. But it is a time to be creative. You know, it is a time to think about how you can help your children um, to get on with doing things. A great way to do that is, you know, lots of people are having all sorts of orders from Amazon and other uh, companies like that. Don't throw the boxes away. Give the kids the boxes and a big roll of sellotape and get them to make a pirate ship or a, a camp or something. They can spend hours happily playing with them, those sort of things. It doesn't matter if they've got all of the blankets and um, off their bed and, and the, uh, the cushions, if they're making a camp and it's keeping them entertained and occupied. Yeah, you can tidy up and they can help you later. But just remember um, that it is different times and some of the rules that you have in your house may not be helping you at the moment. You know, prioritising, it may be that particularly if you've got very little children, that you and your partner share time working or that you work in the evening and that you concentrate on your children. Get your gra their grandparents um, involved and use TV and internet. Several of my friends have set up uh, their grandparents and have set up grandparents hour. So once a day they read, play games over the internet with their grandchildren, giving the parents an hour off. If you've got grand, uh, parents or brothers or sisters or friends who can do that, you know, perhaps have a pool where you share on Zoom, where three or four of you in the team you know, do an activity uh, for children on a rolling program once a week. You can actually give yourself a lot of time by being thoughtful. Involve your kids and your partners in practical things wherever possible. You know, there's nothing which says that you've got doormat on your forehead. And the children love being involved in their cooking and it's a great way for them to learn about weights and measures. Um, so again, use what you're having to do anyway to entertain them. I've talked about maximizing the time with your partner. If you're a single parent, then you know, how, how can you um, access external help? Remember that you are going to have to do things differently. Some of them will work. Some of them will work sometimes and some of them won't work at all.
but don't beat yourself up, just give it a go. Let's talk about the use of technology. Get to grips with it so far as you can, but technology can be sneaky as it was last week. Um, there are so many different ways of contacting people now. I would suggest use one or two and get to know them well. Don't try and do it all. It's a bit of a nightmare. But recognise that sometimes things will go wrong. Last week, my internet connection, I live in a village, and the interconnection, internet connection on Thursday and Friday when it was bad weather, I think everybody was in either working on the computer or watching Netflix. Um, it was really, really iffy. So, so far as you can, have contingency plans. If you haven't started podcasting, that's a great way of getting out to your, um, to your team, to your clients and to potential new clients. And if it's something that's fairly easy to set up, you can, um, you can um, video on Facebook Live or Zoom, and then you can uh, send it out to your email list, to your Facebook and uh, Instagram and LinkedIn um, accounts to all of the people there. But start to be a little bit creative. I think where we're all going to have to make a difference is with more and more people are, are wanting video. I'm told that the attention span of the average person is now less than a goldfish. Apparently the research shows that goldfish have an attention span of 10 um, or 11 seconds. How on earth they know that, I don't know. And people will now spend an average of six seconds on any a web page, webinar, uh, videos, GIFs and things like that will capture people's attention. But it can be intimidating the first time you're behind a camera. My tip to you is put a photograph or a picture behind the camera of someone and speak to that person rather than speaking to your faceless screen, which can be incredibly intimidating. I feel very confident in front of the camera now. But two and a half years ago, when I started all of this uh, with Genuinely You um, and doing stuff online, bearing in mind I didn't have a Facebook page and I didn't have a LinkedIn uh, profile, I was very intimidated by the camera. But practice makes perfect. Who was the golfer who said, isn't it interesting, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And I think it's very true of things like using technology. Um, hosting on live training uh, sessions remotely can be a really great way of delivering your business in a different way. But the normal principles do apply. Be very, and I mean very well prepared, not only with your content, but with technology. Learn to mute and unmute participants. It can be very, very disruptive if people have got um, their microphones on and they're having a conversation or the dog's barking. If you've got a dog, you know, so far as you can, put the dog in another room. I've got a cat. I, he is convinced I'm his slave. Um, and I'd closed the door, but during a session last week, somehow he got the door open. And the first I knew of it is when he jumped on the computer. And suddenly, instead of seeing the slides and me, all they could see was Leo's face. Fortunately, he didn't cut uh, things off. So I've learned now and I put in two doors away uh, with the doors closed. Invest in a good microphone. If you've got a, a, a microphone on your computer, which is high quality, you may get away with it. But if not, it's worth investing. I mean, it's important to eradicate or minimize noise. But in these days at the moment, it is important to recognize that people are doing the best they can. They may be in a small environment with small children. I mean, many of you would have seen the video that went viral of the, the uh, presenter who was presenting when his toddler came in and his wife was trying to take the toddler out by being on her hands and knees and crawling, and the child was as insistent on staying as she was in trying to get him out. You know, there was a time when, you know, it would be the most dreadful thing if you were in a, in a meeting with uh, potential clients or clients or colleagues, and a toddler ran in with no clothes on. These days, people just laugh. However, I would say to you, just remember, be professional. It's all very well for your toddler to arrive with no clothes or to ask you that, you know, that they want the potty and can you help them? But you be professional. I shared last week two situations that I found 
quite just mind blowing. One of them, I was in a, in a meeting, a networking group, but there was a guy in bed um, showing his hairy chest in bed while the meeting was going on. That's where he was running the meeting from. Now that, that picture will stay with everybody in that networking meeting. So when he comes suited and booted, we won't see the suited and booted version of him. What we will be seeing is him with his hairy chest in bed. The other one I'd like to share is people hadn't looked behind. And what you had was somebody who'd done the washing and had it on the radiator behind them. And they didn't use person. Again, it's not a great look. So just be very mindful about the stuff behind you. Do practice looking into the camera. I'm very conscious that I've been you know, looking at my slides and perhaps not looking at the camera as much as I should. But remember, it's the camera that you're looking at and not something else. So be very mindful of that. And you know, again, being tolerant of it is important for the person on the receiving end, but you need to be the best version of you that you can be. If you're running a longer session, then please structure breaks. You wouldn't do a three hour or an all day session without lots of breaks of different activities of going and have a cup of, a cup of tea. Uh, make sure that you, you create those when you are um, making your online training. Um, Zoom's great, there's break breakout activities, you can ask people to vote, all sorts of things that you can use. Again, get used to the technology. Um, so, we've talked, I've just talked about structuring in enough breaks. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying to people, go and grab a cup of coffee, we'll resume in five minutes. Have the confidence to do that. But if you say you're going to start in five minutes, start in five minutes. Don't train people to, um, to not believe you. If you're going to start at a particular time, start at a particular time. So people know you mean what you say. Self-care, absolutely vital. I've got a cup of water, a, a, a glass of water. If I keep drinking from my glass of water, it will soon be empty. But if I put it under a running tap, it would very quickly fill up and overflow. And self-care is vital in all the time, but particularly now, uh, because then make sure that you are giving people your overflow and not running on empty. Do be safe, follow the guidelines. But it's so important that you eat well. You know, lots of people are using food, alcohol, and maybe drugs to compensate for the fact that they're stressed. It's not sensible. If you're eating lots of sugary things, they will ultimately make you feel depressed. And don't give them to your kids. If you want a quiet time, don't be feeding them lots of sugar. I know from my time as a head, you know, the afternoons where they'd had a sugar rush at lunchtime, my goodness me, you notice the difference. Limit alcohol, it's a depressant. It makes you feel good and confident in the moment, but it does, there's always the drop down. And the same with recreational drugs. Exercise is a great antidote to the stress hormones, stress hormones, adrenaline. If you watch um, uh, TV programs of um, medical programs, they inject adrenaline straight into the heart to make it start again when it's stopped. It's very strong. Hydrocortisone and cortisol, they're all the stress hormones. They're used um, for animals trying to escape. We're not that evolved from cavemen and women. And so those those chemicals stay within the system unless we burn them off. But exercise and the second one, laughter, they're great antidotes. They create endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, all of the feel-good hormones. So it's really important that you get exercise, even if you can't get out, you know, running on the spot, dancing, doing something which gets your heartbeat going. And laughter is a great way um, to make you feel better. Don't underestimate the power of deep breathing. Most people when they're stressed breathe very shallowly and the balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide gets completely skewed. If you breathe deeply four or five deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth to the count of five can make you feel much better, much more grounded. It's really important. This is my particular challenge is creating the boundary between work and personal time. And if you live on your own, it's particularly difficult because um, there's nobody saying, come and have a cup of tea or it's dinner time. 
that it is important, particularly the boundary um, at the end of the day before uh, going to bed. Take regular breaks from being on the computer, even if you, as you just get up, walk around and make yourself a cup of tea. Giving your days a structure is really great for you, but it's also important for your children. Children need structure to feel safe. And as grown-ups, we're just big children, so it's important for us as well. Good quality sleep is important, so stop working well before bedtime, particularly um, being on the computer or on your phone. And I would say really limit the amount of time you spend watching the news and the commentaries about the crisis. Watch it, yes, once a day to keep up to date, but endlessly glued to the news. That negativity is really damaging. And the same if you're constantly talking to people who are negative, limit the time because it has an impact, a negative impact on you and your well-being. One way that I think is a real antidote to that is collecting gratitudes. Because when you collect gratitude, you have to be in the moment. You can't be worrying about the past or anxious about the future. So as you go through your day, look and choose things that you're grateful for. A nice cup of tea in the morning, a hot shower, somebody's phoned you and, and said, how are you? Uh, an enjoyable meal. For me, nature is a great source of gratitude. I'm looking out at my small courtyard and it's full of beautiful plants. The magnolia is out um, and I've got fuchsias that have been out all winter. So collect your gratitudes and then just before you go to sleep at night, scan the day and choose your top five. It's a great thing to do with your kids as well. But what it starts to do is to recalibrate the brain so it starts to focus on what's positive and what you can do rather than what you can't. Meditation, many people find that really, really helpful. Other people find that, you know, that, that, that for me, it's gardening is one of my forms of meditation. Or it could be that you are being, doing something creative and that forms meditation. And many people I know use those adult coloring books, which takes you into a state um, of just relaxation. And that's really important. Listening to music can be a great mood changer. Dance about the house and do ministry, ministry of silly walks. Those of you that um, are um, Monty Python fans, it'll make you laugh, it'll make you smile. If you can get out in nature, do it, but do it safely. Get out in the garden. It's an ideal opportunity to get your hands dirty. Again, great with the kids, get them growing some vegetables. Then you'll, they'll, I'll tell you that those children that grow the vegetables will eat them. We found that at school in the school garden. Be creative. When was the last time that you drew or you made something on the sewing machine or that you, uh, I, uh, one Saturday, I sat, I can't, can't go to the card shop. So I, I made a, a lot of, of cards and it was really satisfying. Revisit those things that you enjoyed doing as a child. If you have children, do it with them. If not, then just do it by yourself. But do activities which fill you up, that make you feel good. Use your time constrict constructively. Will you keep going waiting for this crisis to pass? You know, being the, uh, the pessimist, the ostrich? Are you just gonna sit there waiting for things to go back to normal? Because it's my belief that we're never gonna go back to the old normal. We're going to go into the new normal. And that may be several iterations of new normal. Or are you using this time to truly invest in yourself so that when you come out of this, that you are in pole position? If you have a business, that your business is in pole position. Are you training and developing your staff so that they are better able um, to help you succeed in the new normal? It makes so much sense to utilize the best of this time. Are you creating brand awareness, marketing, developing relationships? All of those things are things that you can quite easily do from home now. They don't have to cost you a lot of money. They do, have to co uh, they do cost you your time, your focus and attention. Coca-Cola is a great example of this. In the 1920s and the Great Depression, people couldn't afford Coca-Cola, but that didn't stop them advertising. They were on billboards. They did everything they could to keep their name in the frame. And when people could, uh, things eased and people could afford it, going and buying um, a, a bottle of Coca-Cola was one of the first things that they did. 
and it was the bedrock of their success today. Seek help. Look for opportunities for help and support and collaboration. Join meetup groups, they're free. Um, there's the London Professional Networking and Training Group, which is one of mine. There's another, the Enlightened Entrepreneurs. Um, join Collaboration Global. They've got an online uh, membership, uh, which is very, very um, uh, reasonable and great benefit. Within chaos and disruption, there are great opportunities. Remember, more millionaires are created in times of economic downturn than in boom. And I'm not talking about profiteering now. I'm talking about people who see the need and the opportunities. And there are going to be different needs. How can you help? How can you, uh, the word is pivot, which I hate, but how can you find the opportunities and move forward? Remember, the opportunities are there if you look for them. And those who are prepared to grab them and to do things differently will ultimately thrive. This crisis will pass. And when it does, will you be ready to thrive? Or will you be just trying to get going at that point? What are opportunities have you identified for you as an individual, for your business, if you're a team member? What ideas have you got for your business moving forward and have you shared those? If you're a business owner, have you used your people, um, your, their ideas? Have you asked them? Because very often they've got lots to offer. Remember, this will pass. Now, if you'd like some help from me, you can find me on genuinely-u.com. There's one-on-one -on -one programs. There's a membership um, group there. And there's also the, about the Enlightened Leadership Program. But if you're interested in finding out more about leadership, go straight to the Enlightened Leadership um, website um, and you can find out all about the Enlightened Leadership Program there. And if you want to contact me, there's my email and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. But thank you very much for listening. It, uh, it's been a real pleasure. I hope it's been useful for you. So over to you, Amanda. Can't hear you. I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Another technical issue, <clears throat> which we all love. Um, so I'm just going to reshare my screen with you as, um, as Gina has done previously with, with us. So just bear with me a second. We're actually switching between different uh, presentations at the moment and, um, and that can be quite um, difficult at times. So just, um, just bear with us while we do that. So I'm just going to try and get my presentation back on. Just bear with me a little second. While you're doing that, one of the things I'd say to people who are listening to this is it's really, really helpful to write things down. You know, to have a, a if you like, a, a, a piece of paper with, um, divide it up into all of the positives, all of the potential negatives, and to look for what are the things that you can do for each of the, the positive things, what are your ideas? What are your solutions for each of the negative things? And where it's immovable, remember if you can't, you can't change the, the situation, you can change the way in which you react to it. So what can you do differently? Right, over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Gina. That was really interesting. And I'm certainly going to take away a few tips for me as much as um, I hope you as an audience will do so. I particularly liked the comments and overview of self-care and how vital that is at the moment. I think it's really, really difficult. And I've spoken to so many trainers, coaches and educators about creating boundaries with work and home because I know many of you are flat out running businesses in a different way. And so actually for some of you, it's actually quite hard to find the time in the day to look after yourself, especially if you have young children or animals. So I just wanted to give a little recap of what we've covered so far. So we started out looking at the science behind this all, 
and the fact that there is an awful lot of unease and confusion and as we said today we are not taking it lightly of the awful crisis that is out there at the moment but as i said earlier this creates noise this creates um, uncertainty but as gina has talked through you then bring that back you, you use that energy you channel it in a certain way to build your resilience to really, really reset your mind and look at, well, where are the opportunities? How do I stop being a pessimist, as Gina advised, and how do I become an optimist? And remembering that, you know, during the Second World War and the Great Depression, there were more millionaires made than there have been in usual times. Because as I said earlier, humans are really good at seeing a bad situation happen using their imagination, being creative, and developing ideas and concepts. And that's exactly what we're advising you to do with your training, with your education online, and within one-to-one -one coaching sessions. And so as you slowly go up this curve here, <clears throat> excuse me, what do you really think, it, would you really, really need to think about how you're going to deliver these positive experiences? Because I really think, and I'm sure Gina will agree with me, that it's not just about developing resilience for yourself, but it's also being aware that your delegates, of course, are going through the same thing. We're all in this boat together, but they might not be as resilient as you hope. And so there's a little bit of give and take there. And as, and as Gina has said, you know, be kind, be absolutely kind to one another. And certainly don't worry about professionalism in that if your cat or your job, a dog, sorry, or if your young child jumps on you, everybody is much more understanding than normal. So just one last thing that I wanted to cover was just giving a good think about your digital presence. Okay, so this is you now online. You have a digital twin. It's an, it's an expression that's being used quite a lot now. And so as we go forwards, taking all of Gina's tips and advice and information, you need to create a positive mindset. And in order to do that, you keep the science in mind. Remember that, as Gina alluded to, when we start to find positive solutions from what is an awful, tragic situation, it starts up the dopamine and the serotonin new, uh, motor neurons and feelings and neural connections that actually build you up into somebody that can look at something positively and particularly for you to develop a great learning experience. So you have to get in the mindset, you have to create that positive mindset and not see the challenges around you or get despondent about what's happening. So cancel out those negative emotions or shift them. And again, think about your delegates. Think about what's going wrong for them and what pressures they might have on them. As Gina said, you know, some of them will be at home with limited social contact. Others may have learning uh, difficulties. So in last week's session, we talked about um, the contribution from one of our other organizations, which is being aware that not all of your delegates will be able to see, they may have visual impairments, they may be slightly deaf, they might have autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, etc. So you've really got to think about how you can encompass your audience. And you can't assume that everybody that's dialing in to your sessions are uh, physically and mentally able to process all of the different variables and content that you're talking through. And we'll make available the recording of last week's webinar where we just went into that in a little bit more detail. So this brings us on now to the Q&A section. And so because this is now a recorded version, we've actually downloaded some of the questions from the chat and we're going to sort of navigate our way through those. So just to recap, you will get a recording of the webinar. You will also get the slide deck 
and where possible we will create a notes PDF with the main Q&As on it. Oh, here's Gina. So one of the first questions we got was how do you make sure that you're communicating resilience to your learners? How can you transfer the knowledge that you've gained from this seminar or from others about creating a resilient learner? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think inevitably you have to model what you want from others. Mm. So through your language, your mm. tone of voice, your body language, it's no good saying, you know, we're really upbeat if your shoulders are drooped and you're, you know, that you're sitting and there's no energy in your voice. Um, it's about the questions you ask. So let me give you an example. So we've got this problem. Now, there's not a lot we can do about it. Um, so got any ideas? As opposed to, all right, we've got this problem. We know that it's a challenge, but we're up for it. So what are the potential solutions that you can find? What can we draw upon that we've already done in the past? Who do we know that might have some answers that we haven't got at the moment? What would be our ideal outcome from this? And what are the first few steps that we can take? The pace, the tone, the, the, the very nature that what we're asking of people shifts and what it demonstrates is that you're not in victim mode, poor us, poor me, but actually, do you know what? We're gonna write this story and if we're gonna write this story, you're gonna be heroes, not victims. And so it's not a recipe in the sense of, you know, you say this and you do that. It's more about how you're being than what you're doing or saying. Thanks ever so much, Gina. Yeah, I, I definitely echo, uh, echo those sentiments and how you can sort of transfer your mind and, and uh, sort of almost through learning transfer, invigorate your learners as well and not be that victim. Okay, so we had another question about how do you engage teenagers if you are delivering training, not only to adults, but also, also to a slightly younger audience so how do you deliver that training and how can you make sure that you build resilience in i think um we underestimate youngsters um that we think that we've got to dumb it down for teenagers and i think many of them feel patronized by that mm. um, so i think the messages don't need to be dumbed down at all but i do think the delivery needs to be different they are very often much more engaged by visual things by things where there is activity on the screen, if you're doing it on the screen. Um, and I think you've got to be conscious, whoever your audience is, of, of being able to satisfy different, um, different learning styles. But I think with teenagers, one of the things to do is to ask them, to say, you know, these are really, uh, these are really tough questions. Um, I don't want to dumb it down. So how about I ask the questions on the understanding that if I'm being too technical or I'm making this too complicated, that you let me know. Because it's my belief that, and you can see from the sort of presentation that I've given, I don't use jargon. I don't use technical language. And the sort of presentations that I do, I could do to primary school kids and to um, top CEOs. Because I think the old saying, keep it simple, stupid, is really, really true. Mm. Young people, particularly teenagers, don't underestimate them. Um, but at the same time, don't try and get over complex ideas um, over um, in, in a way that it feels complicated. But I'd say that's good practice, whoever you're talking to. Um, Thank you, Gina. Yes, certainly um, another contribution we've had from a training provider that I work, just worked with a little while back, um, they were actually using film, so clips of movies, yeah. um, to illustrate a particular point. So they were either uploading a YouTube video or they were just providing a little clip. And they in particular were using uh, Horrible Bosses, which is a reasonably uh, recent film with Jennifer Aniston in, who is the most hideous boss. Yeah. And they were trying to talk about, um, they were trying to transfer to teenagers about what different values are and how different values work and what you should do if you come across an uncomfortable character. 
And they said that, you know, using this methodology, using clips from films and video, really recaptured their um, attention. I'm so sure that works, but again, I think that works very well for adults too. Yes, yes. Humour used appropriately can help. The other thing I would say um, is, you know, we're off, we often shy from talking about deep things, values and so on with youngsters. I am, have recognised over the years that actually they're often better than adults at doing mm -hmm. it because they don't have the filters and all of the baggage mm. uh, that, that older people have. So um, good luck with the, whoever asked the question, but go for it and they'll let you know if it's working. Thank you, Gina. Okay, so one of the, and I haven't highlighted all of the questions from the chat because there were quite a few, um, but these were the main sort of themes that came out. So um, you talk a little bit about structure mm -hmm. and looking after yourself, uh, keeping a boundary between work and home. Um, but how do you create structure, asked somebody, when you're juggling all of these different um, family responsibilities, needing to visit elderly relatives or looking after young children, plus at the same time, delivering really positive learning experiences. So you, could you just give some further context and, and um, information around structure? I think it's interesting, isn't it, that many people shy away from structure, mm. uh, but my view is that once you have a structure in place, then you have the freedom to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, many people are juggling, you know, particularly those people who are the middle generation. They've got young children and they've got elderly parents to deal with and work and general living. So in many ways, it is, it is different to normal. Uh, there's, an, uh, there's other elements, but in many ways, these are people who've been juggling the, the, many of the challenges before. And so, first of all, what can you draw upon in terms of, um, of, of life before COVID? And one of the things I would say to you is prioritise. You know, does it matter if the house is more untidy, particularly during the day, than it used to be? You know, what's most important in terms of the time that you spend with your children? Um, and recognising that some days you'll get it right, and some days you'll go to the end of the day and think, how have I spent my time? But, you know, planning. And one of the things that I've done with clients prior to COVID is to get people to plan, not to the point of, you know, every moment, but okay, in this, in tomorrow, what are your absolute priorities? Whatever else happens, that needs to be done because it's both urgent and important. Mm. Yeah. And then introducing the idea of kissing the frog, you know, do the job that you hope, hate most first, because that, um, that gives you a real buzz in terms of sense of, of uh, achievement. But also if you don't do it and you're having to face that and put it off, it takes time and energy to do, to do that. Think about your priorities in terms of each of the groups of people that you have. And if you've got a partner, sit down and work out who's the best person to do what and when. If you've got children, again, I think we underestimate children unless we're talking about very little children. Having a family conference and talking about what we're gonna to do tomorrow, what are the priorities, so that in the morning you can say to little Johnny or Frida, okay, remember now's the time, We've, you've had breakfast, you're all ready, now's the time to go and do your schoolwork and mummy and daddy are going to do theirs. And we'll get together in however long. And then having a, a situation where meal times, you have them together. Mm. That you stop for a cup of coffee and you go out into the garden, that you do a bit of exercise, have a cup of coffee, come back in. It's, you know, once you start to think about what your priorities are for each day and looking at the priorities over the week, over the fortnight, then it gets much easier to do. The challenge is when people think that everything is urgent and important, and it can't be. Emails are a classic example. Don't forget about COVID, you know, emails are insistent and people give them status, which is far bigger than they need. Mm -hmm. Because they come in doesn't mean you have to look at them straight away and answer them straight away, all right? 
put them into the priority mix and make sure that whatever is going on, that you focus your time on the things that you deem to be most important. And I would say to you, if you've got children, putting them at the bottom of the list is going to cause you all sorts of problems. You know, dealing with them and sorting them out um, and giving them the best uh, possible situation um, within the constraints that you have will actually free you more time than it costs you. Ignoring that will cost you much more. Thank you for that, Gina. I think um, I'd just like to sort of build on your answer there. So I think when you're dealing with emails, and I have talked to a number of trainers and coaches about this, because obviously for many of you, you're trying to create new online sessions or starting a whole new uh, portfolio that is running online. So with regards to email, as Gina says, they're going to flood in um, potentially more than usual. So it's perfectly acceptable at the moment to put an out of office on and be very clear that you're juggling family responsibilities as well as work, that their email is important, but it may take you up to 72 hours to respond. And then that way you give yourself some breathing time. And I think Gina, Gina building on your, your conversation there about looking at well, what's really important for today and what emails do I need to answer today and what could be shifted to tomorrow or the following day. So that's a really good sort of tip one of the trainers provided. And I also think um, I'd just like to contribute something I learned when I listened to a recent podcast with Terry Waite. And obviously Terry Waite, for those of you that haven't heard of him, was somebody who was kept prisoner for five years, isolated in a cell overseas. And he talked a lot on this podcast about how he developed resilience, how he kept a positive mindset. But what he used to do at the end of each day was he was given a sort of pyjama outfit. But at the end of each day, he used to take off his pyjamas and fold them up and put them under his pillow because he didn't have a structure to the day at all. So he said, you know, my captors thought I was crazy. But what he was doing was creating a structure to help build that resilience out. And I just thought that that was really interesting. Okay. Okay. It's an interesting structure, aren't they? And I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Getting dressed for work, um, if you're going to be working, I don't mean necessarily suited and booty, but, you know, not lounging mm -hmm. around in pyjamas. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so a couple of other people have said, and this is just the last question, because um, we don't want to sort of make this a longer video uh, than necessary. Um, but in terms of building resilience on a session, what do you need to do about setting out the etiquette of the session? So what your expectations are of the learners? Um, if you're going to run polls or any other interactive um, pieces or animations within video, how do you build up the resilience to make sure that those run successfully? And how do you give you know, really, really uh, crystal clear advice on the overall etiquette of the session? And what I mean by that is, you know, how are people going to use the chat? Are you going to use, if you're in Zoom or something similar, breakout rooms? So the question uh, to you, Gina, is how do you set all of that up so it becomes interactive and builds resilience in the learners as well okay. as assisting you? So first and foremost, the principles are the same whether you've got a face-to-face -face group um, mm -hmm. or an online group. Mm -hmm. That you set up the session and how it's going to be run, what the expectations. So for example, are there going to be questions, are you going to answer questions from the chat room mm. um, as you go we're we going to do them at the end letting people know that there are going to be a variety of activities bearing in mind though that there'll be many people who are experienced in using all of those and other people for whom it may be the first mm. time mm. and reassuring them that, that you're there to help them and that actually that if they, if they don't get it right first time it's not the end of the world so for me, it's about being very clear about what your expectations are. It's very clear what you're going to be offering. Um, and then, if you like, providing a map 
and you might do that with your with one of your first slides like you used to housekeeping you know there's going to be no fire drill and um the loser you know the second door on the left and we're having coffee at 11 and lunch at two or whatever um give people the route map uh, in terms of the structure of the program now if there's something that you want them to do um, and it's something that perhaps some of your people may not be familiar with. When you're sending the invitation or a reminder, you might want to give a few instructions so people can print those off and have those available if you think that that would be useful. But again, so much of this is using the normal principles, but with knobs on and making it really clear. Thank you, Gina. That's that's really helpful. So we're just going to wrap up the questions from there. I'm sure between us, Gina and I can talk about resilience all day. But um, thank you so much, Gina, for your contribution. And I think it's you know been extremely relevant and certainly something that members asked for in our recent member survey. So I'm just going to recap a couple of things because on the uh, session, we ran a couple of polls and we had approximately 60 to 70 attendees who were not members of the CPD Standards Office, your subscribers who we love communicating with, but not necessarily members yet. So if you are interested in accreditation, do come and talk to us, either visit the URL below or, um, I've got, sorry, a, a window up, or make an inquiry through our website, and we'd be delighted to talk to you about that. We're providing particular um, support for both members and subscribers around how to cope and how to learn about the best way to deliver your educational portfolio online. So we have several other webinars that we'll send you that, that are pre-recorded. We're also offering discounts to anybody who is delivering training to frontline workers or NHS trusts themselves. We're also offering free 30 minute consultations with our membership team about the best way to move your training online. So that's specifically for members, but by all means, if you're thinking about joining us, then make an inquiry and one of our client support team will be in touch with you promptly. I think the main sort of expression I think that I would like you to keep in your mind, as well as looking at that graph a minute ago about the science bit, is that the government is constantly saying, stay at home, protect lives, save the NHS, or sorry, save lives and protect the NHS. And I think our mantra that we can take away from this session in terms of being really good trainers, coaches and educators with a really positive, strong mindset is stay at home, save your clients and learners and protect your business. And by thinking about saving your clients and learners, this is all about you being in a positive mindset and also ensuring that your delegates are as well. So do get in touch with us if you have any other queries. Also on the session, we asked people what are the topics you'd like us to provide and gave a little overview. And a strong response was to further soft skills training. So we'll shortly be running a webinar around another topic of soft skills and business support for people that are running training and coaching businesses. So thank you uh, for being a part of the three recording and this webinar. Thank for to Zoom who enabled us to share screen and not give us any technology hiccups. And a big thank you to Gina for joining us today and giving us such a great contribution. So thank you so much for that, Gina. My pleasure. And if people um, want to be in touch, then you've got the slide and uh, my address um, and website will be on the show notes as well. So happy to answer any questions. Yeah. And just picking up on that, of course, this is recorded. There'll be the slides attached. Um, if there is an appropriate Q&A document that, where we haven't asked, uh, answered all of the questions, that'll be circulated to you too. So keep well, stay safe work on your businesses, have a positive mindset and create wonderful, memorable, positive learning experiences for your delegates.
good luck and goodbye from Amanda and Gina. It's been lovely to speak to you and, uh, and to run another session here today. So thank you very much.